We've covered unit one, we've covered unit two. So hello, to, welcome to unit three day. So what I've done for you here in this packet, which is smaller than units one and two, is I've condensed all of the things you need to know about trig functions into one spot. But to start us off, without looking at any notes, I wanna see how much of this unit circle you can fill out. For instance, the things I would want you to fill out for this unit circle are the radian measures all the way around. Like I'll get you started, this one's zero, this one's pi over six, all the way around. And I would like for you to fill out the coordinate points. So for instance, this is the coordinate point one comma zero. This would be the coordinate point square root three over two comma one half. I want you to see how much of this you can fill out all the way around without looking at the ones that are on my wall, without looking at the ones that are in your notes, just see what your brain can remember of the unit circle. I'll give you a little bit of time. The one hint I will give you, because I think some of us would be able to do this if we remembered, that coordinate points on the unit circle are always r times cosine of theta and r times sine of theta. But in our case, the radius is one since it's a unit circle. So you can think of it as cosine of theta comma sine of theta, if that's helpful. Okay, so we have the whole unit circle, and yes, I'll allow you to continue filling this out while I talk, because we got the angles. Y'all felt really good about that. Most of you I saw had quadrant one written down, which is amazing. Remember, if you know quadrant one, you know the whole thing. Just change the sign of the appropriate coordinate. What we forget with our unit circle and what we're not strong about is the tangent values, because tangent is not seen when you just do the regular unit circle like I've had you do. So since these are our notes to study up before the AP test, we also need to know the tangent values at all of these coordinate points. Tangent is just sine over cosine. So really all I have to do is take this value and divide it by this value. So what is zero divided by one? Zero. zero. So tangent is zero at zero. For the other one, one half divided by square root three over two. You can just get rid of the divide by twos. So that's one over square root three, but I don't let you write answers like that. How have I made you write that answer? Radical three over three or square root three over three. How about for pi over four, what is the x value or the y value over the x value? One. one, they're the same thing. How about the one up there? Radical three. And then up at the top, if I do one divided by zero, what is that? undefined. So that's your tangent values all the way around. But remember, once you have the tangent values, you can just copy paste them into the other quadrants. So in this quadrant, it should be negative square root three and then negative one and then negative square root three over three uh, and then zero. There's no negative zero. That's not a thing. In this quadrant, they're all positive because that's the t quadrant, which means this would be square root three over three, one and square root three. What happens at pi over, or three pi over two at the bottom? It's undefined again, because you're dividing by zero. And in this quadrant, again, they're just negative. So we have negative square root three, negative one, and negative square root three over three. I don't know how many times I can say it, but knowing the values of all of these angles around your unit circle for sine, cosine, and tangent is paramount to being able to answer the questions in unit three. So if you don't have these memorized or don't have a way to get to it, if it's not memorized, you, you could derive it in your head, we need to put that on our high priority list for the next two weeks. Okay, I've taught you a few tricks for this. Remember we have the hand trick where if you were doing quadrant one, the first, your uh, ring finger represents pi over six. Your middle finger represents pi over four. Your index finger represents pi over three. Your pinky would represent zero and your thumb represents pi over two. That's the entire first quadrant. And when it comes to the hand trick, here's the pattern again. To do sine, you count the square root of the number of fingers below your reference angle, divide by two. Cosine is the number of fingers above your reference angle, divided by two, and tangent is below, divided by above. So that's just a trick to take with you because you don't get a reference sheet on your test, but your hands get to come with you through each section of your test. So you can use the hand trick very easily to find these values. Pick a way you're gonna memorize it with a table, with the unit circle, with the hand trick, and let that be what you're gonna do. Go ahead and flip this over. There's not a lot we're filling out on these notes because I'd rather spend more time actually practicing, but I did condense everything into one place. 
What I do want you to highlight here is that when you're doing basic trig, regular trig, you remember that the input value is an angle measure. That's how we did the whole unit circle. So like the sine of pi over six is one half. You plugged in pi over six, the angle measurement, and you got out a ratio or the value of that trig function. The reason I'm having you do that is because comparing basic trig with all of its um, characteristics, which I've written there and you can read. I'm not going to read back at you. We're pretty good at this stuff. And we jump down to where it says inverse trig functions down towards the bottom. Notice that inverse, we just learned about this last class, is where you switch the x and the y, which means that now your input value is the ratio and your output value is an angle, meaning you're reading the unit circle. You're reading your table backwards for inverse trig. But for inverse trig, sine and tangent can only occur in the quadrants 1 and 4, which means that their positive values for inverse trig are going to come out of quadrant 1, and the negative values come out of quadrant 4. So you're doing negative angles or angles going clockwise. For cosine, it's normal. You will use obtuse angles here for positive or for negative values. But for tangent, again, your positive values are in quadrant one and your negative values are the clockwise angle, just the negative version of the angle, not all the way around the unit circle. Again, this page is really just like a reference for you to remember what each of these graphs look like. Um, the one thing I wanna point out to you before we move from this table, what should a sine function start at on the y-axis? The midline. So we're going to put midline right here. And remember, always, it starts at the midline and immediately increases. That is a typical sine wave. So if you are writing a sine function, you need to make sure you phase shift it to where it starts at a midline going up. Not a midline going down, but a midline going up. So if you want to highlight this, this is the shape you're looking for for sine. When it comes to cosine, what does a cosine graph start at? A maximum, and it should immediately do what? Instead of increase, since it's starting at a maximum, it should decrease. So for cosine, you're making sure you're looking for this shape. If you need to phase shift it to where a maximum is at the y-axis, you're looking for the maximum that goes down, which like maximum won't go up afterwards, but you get what I'm saying. Okay, again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time. We were actually pretty good at the sine graphs. But what we are going to do is go over the parts of a sine and a cosine graph, your sinusoidal vocabulary. This ties into FRQ3, which we will continue to practice with slowly through class. When it comes to sinusoidal graphs, we can transform them in four ways. We can change the amplitude, which is the A value. I already have it highlighted, but if you wanted to, to add the colors in here. The B value, which is multiplied on the inside of the function, affects the period of the function or how quickly it finishes a wave. The phase shift is shifting it left and right, and the center line is shifting it up and down. So I have our transformation vocabulary there, as well as what it affects in the like scenario of a sine wave. I also have you the formulas there. So let's just make sure we understand this, and we're gonna find the A, B, C, and D for this graph, okay? So we know A stands for the amplitude, we know B would be the period, we know C is the phase shift, and we know D would make the midline. For me, it's easiest to start by finding that center line or the midline. You can use the formula where you do max plus min divided by 2, especially if you don't have a graph. But if you have a graph, you can literally see where the midline is. Where is the midline of this graph? 1. So the D value here is 1. For me, that's the easiest thing to start with because I can find maxes and mins easy and just count in between them for their average. Next thing that's easiest for me, in my opinion, to find is the amplitude. Remember, amplitude is the height or the depth of the wave. So how many steps did I take to go from the center line to the max or center line to the min? Four. If I wasn't sure or I wasn't given a graph, I can always do the maximum, which is five, minus the minimum, which is negative three divided by two. Five minus negative three is like five plus three. That's eight divided by two, which is exactly what you said when you counted it, that that distance is four. So you can use the formula or you can use the graph itself. 
In fact, let me show my work on this one to show that this also works. This would be 5 plus negative 3 divided by 2, which is 2 divided by 2, which is 1, which you saw on the graph. The next thing that's easiest for me to find is the B value. The B value requires you to know the period or finding the period requires you to know the B value. So in a graph, we can see the period. How long does it take for this graph to go from midline to midline to for complete one shape? Pi, which means we're gonna find B by doing two pi divided by pi. That's the period of the function. The pi's cancel out, so what is the B value here? Two. The last one is the C value, and now you need to know whether you're writing a sine or a cosine function here to determine C. We're gonna do both. If we were writing a sine function, we just said on the other side that a sine function should start at a midline and go up. Does it currently start at a midline and go up? No, it starts at a midline but goes down, which means I do need to phase shift this one to write the function. Where is the first x value where we are at a midline that's going up? Pi over 2. So we would want to shift this back to the left, which means my phase shift here would be negative pi over 2 because we're moving it left. Let me, let me stand the right direction so this is actually left. Left. You're moving it that direction. If we were writing a cosine version of this graph, cosine wants to start at a maximum and go down. What is the first time that I reach a maximum and then go down? which is what we're going to subtract away, 3 pi over 4, so that we shift it back to the left. So that's the C value. Okay, this sort of thing is one of the things we're going to practice today with our activity. The other thing we're going to practice today is solving trig equations. So the steps here to solve trig, just to highlight it for you, this is going to be something that you want. Uh, first step is always that you're going to isolate the trig function, whatever it takes to do that, usually with linear methods, maybe identities, maybe factoring, uh, or the quadratic form. Then you have to think about your unit circle. And remember, you don't get a unit circle on the test unless you make yourself one over and over again. So we need to start thinking about those angle measures on a unit circle that satisfy the conditions. You will then consider any domain restrictions, meaning if it says, please only answer between zero and pi, make sure you don't give an answer that's bigger than pi or less than zero. And then if it asks you for the general solution or all solutions, that's what I've noticed they write it as, what are all solutions? This is where you write individual equations for each zero, making sure you add this plus two pi k given k is an integer. The last things we covered in unit three and the last things we're gonna have on the reference sheet is all of your identities. If you don't have these identities memorized, this is another place that I want you to spend some time in the next couple weeks learning and memorizing. I know we're pretty good at the reciprocal identities. I know we're pretty good at the quotient identities, but I know we struggle remembering the Pythagorean identities, at least I do. Personally, when I'm memorizing the Pythagorean identities, I only ever memorized this one. And you're like, Miss Quigley, there are like nine versions of this Pythagorean identity. I know, but I straight up couldn't ever remember them when I was a student. I still don't as an adult. I actually have to do this process every time I do a problem. I can remember sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equal to one. What I can't remember is the other versions of it. Obviously the one where you add and subtract sine or cosine around, those are fine but I can't remember the ones that involve tangent or involve cosecant. Like there's just something about my brain that doesn't hold on to them. So here's what I do every time and what you can do so you don't have to memorize more things. If you know you want to have an equation that involves secant, secant is the reciprocal of which trig function? Cosine, which means I want to divide this by cosine squared of theta so that this side, this one over cosine squared of theta turns into secant. But what I do to one part of this fun uh, formula, I need to do it to everything. So I'm going to go ahead and divide all three terms by cosine squared of theta. What is sine over cosine? 
tangent. This is tangent squared of theta. What is cosine over cosine? One. And then we already said that secant is one over cosine of theta. That's the second version of the Pythagorean identity that I asked you to memorize, but honestly, <laughs> I don't have it memorized. I do this every time because I can't hold on to that in my head for some reason. So we know that there's a third one, and that third one involves the cosecant instead of secant. So instead of dividing by cosine, what am I going to divide this one by? Sine. Again, this is just a process to allow you to memorize all nine versions of this just with memorizing one. Again, sine over sine is going to cancel to one. What is cosine over sine? Cotangent. And then we already know that one over sine is cosecant. And so, boom, I have all three versions. That might be helpful for you in memorizing all three slash nine versions of the Pythagorean identity. You don't have to memorize all nine. You need to memorize one and know how to find the others. But if you're like, I can just memorize stuff, that's great. Memorize it. Know your identities. Missed a little bit. I don't know why this is taking me so long to highlight this. Everything was breaking. Okay, again, the rest of this table, if you don't have your identities memorized, you just gotta put that on your to-do list. Um, I've seen a lot of questions utilize the double angle identity for sine. That was been a popular one, so make sure you have that one. That one wasn't super clear for us as a class. Uh, and then the last topics that we covered in unit three was all about polar functions. And there's a lot of formulas that go into polar functions, but what I, the best tip I can give you when it comes to polar functions, because you can read all these formulas, is this tip down here at the bottom. And I fully believe this. When you are working with polar functions, convert everything into a rectangular function or a Cartesian function, and use that graph to describe the polar function. Because we know they're related and we're more used to seeing the waves of sine and cosine as opposed to the curves around a polar graph. So in a pinch, Convert everything into Cartesian and use your calculator to answer the questions if it's a calculator question. I guess the one other thing here I would, I would highlight star circle underline is the fact that polar functions are always r comma theta, which means their radius is your x, x intercept or what? Your radius goes first like an x coordinate and your theta goes second like a y coordinate, even though theta is the input and radius is your output.